Hi, good morning. Can you hear me, Victor? Excellent. Good morning from San Francisco. It's really uh, a privilege for us to contribute to the Interventional Endoscopy Symposium. This has been a tradition for us, and I think this is the third year that we're transmitting live from San Francisco down to UCLA Harbor. Um, so uh, a, a greeting to uh, all the fellows um, and the audience. Uh, I really think this is a very unique course because you're seeing the true cutting edge of our specialty. We're going to switch topics now. Uh, I just uh, enjoyed some of the discussion about full thickness closure of defects and removal of submucosal tumor, tumors. Very exciting area. Uh, we're also very excited about that, and perhaps uh, at a future date we'll be able to show you some of the things we're doing. But we're going to switch to the topic of management of the patient with uh, acute gallstone cholecystitis, and uh, uh, particularly the poor surgical candidate. This patient today is actually a non-surgical candidate. So uh, if we could please have the case presentation slide projected. I see it's up. So this is a 50-year-old male with uh, chronic gallstone cholecystitis. I'll give you a little bit more detail in just a moment about this. Uh, he is a non-surgical candidate. He's been flatly rejected by the surgeons due to failure of his heart, failure of his kidneys, and failure of his liver. So he's got multi-organ failure. In August of 2015, he developed acute emphysematous cholecystitis. And uh, he experienced a spontaneous gallbladder perforation. So he had fluid. Well, I'll show you the CT in just a moment. But he had fluid um, that had spilled out into the peritoneum. And uh, he had acute peritonitis. And uh, he was treated with a percutaneous cholecystostomy tube. And he miraculously recovered from this. His current CT now shows gallbladder stones and a cholecystostomy tube in place. So he's many little stones in the gallbladder. And these are causing him discomfort. Uh, in addition, he's having issues with the percutaneous drain. It's been in there now for almost a year and a half. Uh, it's causing a lot of discomfort on the skin, a lot of irritation. He's having to empty his cholecystostomy tube multiple times a day. Um, and when the option of potentially internalizing his percutaneous drain was offered to him, he really jumped at this opportunity, this, uh, uh, this possibility. And so that's what we're going to see him for today. Now, if you can switch to the camera to show his abdomen, you can see the cholecystostomy tube in place. And there we go. So you can see uh, here's the collection reservoir here uh, with some uh, bile inside of it. Um, and uh, everything here, the dressing is on. Um, and this is really the... the for, for these patients, uh, the issue of quality of life. Um, you know, he carries this pin to his shirt so that he knows when he needs to empty his reservoir. And that occurs uh, a half a dozen times uh, a day. But as I mentioned, probably the more important issue is that he continues to have discomfort, chronic discomfort to pain in the right upper quadrant. And I think that's the stones because he has a chronic cholecystitis due to the stones that remain in his gallbladder. So the question is not just an internalization. The question is, is it possible for us to endoscopically remove those gallstones internally and then maintain drainage internally using a lumen opposing stent? So that's what I hope to be able to show you today. So um, let me just say a couple of quick words. One of the reasons for the delay was these patients are sick that come to us. Um, these non-surgical patients, they're non-surgical for a reason, or I should say the surgeons reject these patients for a reason. And of course, it presents a big challenge for our anesthesiologists. And today we have one of our best, um, Barry Rose, the Rose, AKA the Rose. So Barry here, um, he has, uh, he's taken care of this patient this morning. It took a lot of time to intubate this patient, stabilize this patient. He's intubated now. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the important role that our anesthesiologists play for the outcome, for the successful outcome of our procedures. All right, so let's bring the team in here. I've got my star nurses. And Kate, come on in. Jeannie, come on in. We're ready to get started. You're going to see everything 
as I'm seeing it, right? So I haven't, I haven't seen this patient prior to this other than interviewing him before the, starting the procedure this morning. So I'm using a therapeutic echo endoscope. This is the Olympus uh, Therapeutic Curve Linear Ray Echo Endoscope, and we're going to insert it now and see what the anatomy looks like. So we're passing this oblique viewing echo endoscope down, and I'll just make a few comments as I'm going through, since uh, we have fellows also in the audience who would benefit from the teaching, I think. It's important that when you cross the GE junction, the cardia, that you have this under some view. Just don't blindly push in here. So make sure that as you make your turn into the stomach, you can see this here, that you don't uh, just forcefully advance here. If you forcefully advance here, you could perforate. So it makes a sharp turn here into the upper body of the stomach. So now I'm going to rotate slightly to the right, and I'm going to follow the body down to the antrum. So we haven't touched this before. You can see that there's a little bit of uh, bleeding, spontaneous bleeding that we see in the antrum. So this is probably some hemorrhagic gastritis. I don't see an ulcer or anything like that. But this is a endoscopic ultrasound, so it's also an endoscopic procedure. And with the oblique optics, we can see uh, endoscopically the antrum, the pylorus, and we're just going to pop into the bulb here, make sure that the anatomy here looks normal. There's no mass or any... Uh, abnormal anatomical configuration that might have an impact on our internal drainage. And we'll even push a little further into the second duodenum, and then we can uh, straighten the scope just like we do the duodenoscope. You can see the ampulla here. There it is. And I think this is all uh, normal. Uh, obviously, if you look at this and you see some of this uh, whitish uh, villus discoloration, you might wonder about uh, an adenoma or so. I don't think that's the case. I think this is all uh, a normal anatomy. And certainly the least of this patient's worries right now, even if he did have a small adenoma there. Um, but I think that's all very normal. We're going to pull back again. I'm going to go back into the long position. So push into the duodenum. And now we're going to switch on our ultrasound. And from the duodenal bulb, we're going to look at his anatomy. And we see a big structure right here. And I'm going to put on our Doppler to confirm it's a vascular structure and it's the portal vein, all right? So it's already an important landmark, so we know where we are. And so we see then above the portal vein, there are a couple more structures here, and I'll mag in for you. There are tubular structures with, with anechoic interiors here and here. So when you see two structures like that side by side, Bet, the bet is that it's probably the bile duct and the cystic duct. And we'll see if this duct here joins this duct there. And we'll mag it up for you just a little bit more so you can appreciate that. So we have two structures here. And by the way, if we put the Doppler on, we see there's no Doppler signal in those two anechoic tubular structures above the portal vein. So here we have the bile duct, and here we have a structure that is the cystic duct that joins the bile duct uh, probably here. So let me just sort of move this around a little bit to sort of see what the anatomy looks like. I'm just sort of turning this around. I'll take the Doppler off. So we already see that there is, are some structures that are shadowing here, right? So this uh, could be already part of the gallbladder that we're seeing. It could be stones in the cystic duct because it comes so close to the bile duct here. And it wouldn't be surprising if there were some stones there. So I'm just sort of turning in a little bit more. We see some lymph nodes here. And the question is whether we're going to have a nice window to the gallbladder. So we see here a structure that's filled with some fluid, which um, could be the gallbladder. Now, we have to be careful that we don't know that there might not be a biloma. There might be a fluid collection outside of the gallbladder. So we want to be sure. Now, first, we'll switch on the Doppler to be sure there's no Doppler signal. There is none. We do see a bunch of material 
here, that would be consistent with sludge and stones. It's shadowing as well, right? It's right adjacent. It does have a wall. We see that here. There's a wall. It's a thickened wall. That's consistent with the gallbladder, all right? So now all the features are looking like gallbladder, and finally, we see there's a tube in there, right? We see a double tram track structure here that is consistent with the cholecystostomy tube in the gallbladder. And up here, you see it even better. Up here, look up here, see the double tram tract? So very echogenic lines that indicates that that is the cholecystostomy tube. So we're getting a better feel for the anatomy now. And as we look at this, we're also evaluating, you know, first determining what's gallbladder, is it the gallbladder? Uh, confirming that it has all the, the uh, features that we would expect of the gallbladder. Uh, but also we want to know what is the relationship of the structure to the duodenal wall. So we see the gallbladder wall here. We see the muscularis propria of the duodenal wall here. We see there is an echogenic layer between this layer here and this layer here. Muscularis propria, duodenal wall. I'll mag it in a little bit more for you. So once again... Muscularis propria, duodenal wall, gallbladder wall, thickened, slightly thickened, echogenic layer in between. What is that echogenic layer? That's fat. Fat is echogenic. So these structures aren't really adherent, right? There is this echogenic layer between the two. The gallbladder is not really adherent. And as I move out towards this direction, we see how the gallbladder diverges further away from the duodenal wall. So if we're going to do a internal um, drainage of the gallbladder, we want to select a location for that drainage where the gallbladder is closest to the duodenal wall. Now, there's a few things we can do to facilitate this procedure. And one of the reasons why I selected this case, we can put the lights up a little bit more in the room so that the audience can see me. I selected this case because I think this is a great case to start with when learning internal gallbladder drainage because you have a safety net. And the safety net is that this patient has a cholecystostomy tube in place. So, you know, we just sort of have um, a backup uh, here just in case anything goes wrong, that we do have drainage of the gallbladder. Number two, we have the ability to infuse water into the gallbladder to distend it some more. And why don't we just do that to show that effect? So I'm going to have uh, Kate or Jeannie come over, or Julie, and um, we're going to disconnect the drain, and we're going to inject some water through our cholecystostomy tube. That is an additional way. If we, for any reason, we're not sure that this is the gallbladder, um, we could inject some fluid and see that fluid fill the gallbladder. Now, we're in, X, we're in an x-ray room, and we certainly could also inject contrast and fill the gallbladder with contrast. We're not leaded here because we don't intend to use x-ray because I'm not, I don't know of a reason to use fluoroscopy at this time. Um, and, but certainly, uh, it's an additional imaging modality that can be beneficial, and if there's an indication, then we absolutely will put on our lead and use x-ray. So the patient's on the x-ray table. We have x-ray available if we need it. So Julie now is just uh, going to take a moment uh, to disconnect. And we can actually show that if we can have our uh, room camera show what Julie's doing. So she's disconnected the bag from the cholecystostomy tube. And she's going to uh, inject some sterile saline or water or whatever it is into the gallbladder. And we'll, we should see it fill and confirm that we're in the gallbladder. So start injecting, please, Julie. Do you see it go in there? You see the bubbles filling in, right? So this is very nice because it gives us a very nice confirmation that this is the gallbladder. And it's descending it a little bit more for us and makes it, a, it will make it a little bit easier. Fill it up a little bit more. So. In essence, what we're trying to do, and we're all very comfortable draining pseudocysts, right? We've all done this, um, most of us, and 
Um, it's very routine. It's been around for tw you know two decades now. Um, but what we're less comfortable with is draining the gallbladder, and uh, that's good. So the reason for that is because we're dealing with a structure that's not adherent, and so there's a risk of leakage here, and it's bile leakage into the peritoneum, not the retroperitoneum, the peritoneum. So uh, that is, you know, the stakes are very different when you drain the gallbladder than when you drain a pseudocyst. Um, so let's measure out the size of this. So the challenge now for gallbladder drainage is how do we do this drainage avoiding any risk of bile leak? We want to be able to get into the gallbladder, place our stent, our lumen opposing stent, and get out as quickly as possible and, and ideally um, eliminate any risk of bile leak. All right, so the diameter here is 3.4. Um, and so that's important to measure out uh, because we need a runway of a good three centimeters for our delivery sheath. All right, so our delivery sheath needs to be in our target organ at least three centimeters so that we have room to deploy the distal flange of the lumen opposing stent. Now in the interest of time, um, I'm not going to go through all the anatomy. We're in a good position now. And I'd rather just get this case done so that we can show you other things. And maybe there's time I can talk a little bit more about gallbladder drainage. We're in a great position, so I'm not going to change anything. I'm going to hold my position right here. And I'm going to ask now our nurses uh, to open up um, our stent. Now, the question is, what's, what size stent should we use? There are two sizes. There's 10 and 15. Now, I think we could use um, a 15 here. Um, because uh, in this case, we have a lot of debris and stones, and we really want to, that's part of our goal here is not just the drainage of fluid. Our goal is really to clear the, the gallbladder of this debris and the stones. So we really would rather have a larger diameter stent. So let's use a 15. I think a 15 is fine. We've got a large enough target for a 15. So we'll open up a 15. And this is the cautery enhanced system. Uh, we, we call this the hot axial system. And this is a system I'm really proud of uh, because I've worked on this for a decade uh, to bring it to the level of mat maturity where it's at. And I do believe it's still evolving. I think you know, we'll see um, you know, future iterations of these improvements, I should say, or refinements. Maybe even improvement is not the right word. Um, but me medicine is always an evolution. Um, but this is uh, something that I think at least gives us the ability now to access the gallbladder and immediately deliver the lumen opposing stent while avoiding any risk of bile leakage. That's the goal, avoid or eliminate the risk of bile leakage. And the only way you can really eliminate that risk is if you eliminate any over the wire exchanges. So every time you exchange an instrument over the wire, uh, you will get some leakage between the wire and the lumen that you've created with your access device. Especially after you've dilated a tract, you've created a big hole, and you're going to have bile then leaking out, flowing out, gushing out, um, as soon as you pull out your dilating balloon, for example, or bougie, or whatever it is that you might use. As soon as you pull that out to exchange it, for your stent catheter, that's when bile leakage can occur. So we want to eliminate the over-the-wire exchanges. That is the Seldinger technique, over-the-wire exchanges. We want to eliminate that. So in a way, we are now going beyond Seldinger. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and insert the device now. And let's get our camera, if I could, to and to show what I'm doing here. I'm a little bit of a, a torqued position here, so we can get then the lights a little bit better so you can see. So I apologize uh, for this awkward position, but I think you can see how we're advancing the sheath down. This is a hydrophilic coated sheath. Uh, and what that means is all you need is to lubricate it with some water, and it becomes very slippery like a glide wire. Right, so this will go very smoothly. It has a diameter of about 11 French, so you need to use the therapeutic channel echoendoscope. So now I am lure locking this in. 
That's no different than an FNA needle. But we also have the advantage that this is a swivel lure lock so that we can actually change the rotation. Now, it so happens that we're looking right at the face where the markings are. So, but it could have been that when we tightened our lure lock, this could have been on the opposite side. Um, and we would, of course, want to turn that towards the operator. Um, and that's what the swivel function is for. We can swivel the catheter uh, towards the operator or whatever orientation you want it to be without loosening the lure lock. All right, so that's swivel lure lock. Now, the first step is the easiest because this is what endosonographers do every day, which is FNA. So this first step is no different than an FNA. And we're using this part as an FNA needle. This is no different than our FNA needle that we advance into our target. We do have it currently locked to prevent accidental advancement. So we have to unlock it first. But our first step is just going to be to advance the delivery sheath. And we're going to apply cautery to enter into the gallbladder. Now, we've already hooked up our cautery, um, and we're, we've, we have our settings on auto cut, so pure cut. We've checked that. We've gone through a checklist. And you'll notice at the top end here, we have a wire that was inserted. This wire has been inserted to the tip of the device. I'm going to have our nurse just help uh, hold this in a little bit better position here. Tip of the device, and there's really a not a need to necessarily advance the wire into the gallbladder. If you advance it too forcefully, you can push the gallbladder away. But it is a nice safety net. I don't actually do it normally, but I'm going to do it today for demonstration purposes. All right, so now we've got one structure there. And we just want to make sure that's uh, whether that's a vessel. It looks like it is a vessel, so we want to avoid that. So I'm looking at this right here. So we want to avoid that. There's a blood vessel. So we want to kind of come here if possible. All right, now, I'm just going to do some fine-tuning, move back and forth. If you're here, you're too close to where the cholecystostomy tube is. And it's probably more like the fundus area, I guess, or I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe the fundus is the right side. Um, it's hard to know exactly. But so we'll, we'll turn around, and we really want to target the anechoic area, right? So just kind of hold that like that. And I'm just advancing now our sheath forward, and I'm looking for the bright echo of it, of the sheath. And I need to see that well. Now, something, th these are all things, this is why the learning curve is so long with interventional EOS, is because when you're torqued as you are in the duodenum now, in the long position and everything, uh, things go off axis. So I'm advancing. We, we see this, of course, with FNA needles, too. So even though I'm advancing this, I don't see the sheath so well, right? So I maybe have to get into a different plane to see where the sheath is. And I really want to see that sheath well. So I've got to figure out you know, why I'm not seeing that sheath, the double tram track. There it is. It's, I'll point it out to you just in case you don't see it. It's right here. And, and you, I'm moving it back and forth, right, like that, OK? And I'm kind of close to those, to those vessels. So I kind of want to see what I can do to get it away. Maybe this might be better. And yet I also want to have it in an area where I have a, a, the maximum runway for my sheath. Right? That's not good. That's too close to the vessel. Right? There are all these little things you got to fine tune. You don't want to be too close to the fundus. You sort of wish you could make that vessel go away. Hold it like that. And remember, even though you're avoiding the vessel, when we, when we deploy our flanges, we don't want those flanges too close to the vessel either, right? Because those flanges could dig in and you, could, you know, could get some bleeding. So let me kind of just play around just for a moment longer. There, I think I'm good. And I think I'm going to go for this spot right here. Now. This is the part that takes, I think, is going to be the most difficult for anyone who starts doing this. You're going to worry if you're going to get in. So I can tell you there's, there's a reason why it took 10 years to, to develop this. And that's because it went through a zillion iterations. These are fine micro wires that extend along the side of the sheath. It's bougie 
shaped at the very tip. The wires run along uh, in a circular fashion at the very tip. So, th so it provides a maximum cutting effect without cooking the tissue too much. So you need that cautery to get through, but you don't want to cook the tissue, and you want to get in as if you were using a scalpel. So I think we're about ready to go now. I'm just going to make sure that the pressure looks good. And I'm going to press on the pedal, and I'm going to hold there just for a quick second and then advance in, OK? So now I'm pressing on the pedal, cautery, and I'm pushing in. And there's some resistance. You see how it's pushing away? So one second, before I push this thing away, I'm going to pull back a little bit, and I'm going to try to recapture my, my view. This is a thick wall, and I'm going to push in again like this. And actually, I did pop in, but I need to see the catheter. There it is. Now, this is the tactile. This is why this will never be done by a robot, because the tactile is so key. And my sheath is in. You see it at the tip here. Hopefully, uh, you can appreciate it there. I'll try to get a better view for you in just a moment. But now that I'm in, I pushed it as far in as I can, as far in as I could see it. I'm going to lock now. So hopefully you can see on the screen, push it in like this. I'm going to lock like that. I'm going to take off the safety. This is this yellow pin, OK? And I'm just going to hold this like this. And I'm unlocking now the upper hub. This is the gray hub. This is what releases the flanges. And I'm going to release the flanges in two separate steps, first distal, then the proximal, completely independent of one another. I've unlocked, and I'm just going to pull back this this gray hub. Very slowly, just pull it back. And I'm not going to pull against any excessive resistance. It should go fairly easy. And if you do have a lot of resistance, you know, then back off. Have your nurse kind of hold the scope so you can keep your view. And I'm pulling back and waiting till it clicks. It just clicked, and you have to give it a second for the flange to deploy. Now, you see the flange. You know, it looks like a, a Mars ship, right? It looks like a spaceship there that just opened up. So our spaceship now needs to land on the surface of the wall. And how do we do that? Well, now we're going to unlock our sheath. Unlock. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. And I'm now going to pull back the sheath and hug it up against the wall like this. See, I'm pulling back, pulling back. And wait till it deforms just a little bit. See, it deformed a little bit. It changed shape. And now I'm going to lock it again. All right. Now, the, this is the step where you could advance your wire in a little bit as a safety net. So the wire's up here. And we'll let the nurse kind of do that. Sometimes you'll see the wire going in. Sometimes you won't. But don't push against resistance, because you could actually push the wire away. But it's just an, in a little bit so that if anything were to happen, you know, the unexpected, right, um, then we've got a, a safety uh, plan B. All right, now, we're ready to deploy the proximal flange. I'm unlocking here. I've got my sheath locked, so nothing's going to happen with that. I've unlocked the gray hub again to deploy the proximal flange. Now, I'm just going to pull back, and of course, that flange is going to deploy in the working channel. And it just deployed. Now, you can't see it deployed because it's in the working channel. So in order to see this, I have to switch to the endoscopic view. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to push the proximal flange out of the working channel. So let's switch now to the endoscopic view. By the way, I guess you've been showing the ultrasound small the whole time. I'm s oh, you just switched it. Very good. Excellent. Camera crew, uh, uh, Alan Zhang is back there and, and my uh, AV team. A great, great team here. So let's give a little bit of air. Our CO2 is on, correct? And on the screen on the right, you can see uh, the, 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 uh, the nitinol wires, right? And I'm going to give a little, little air and push it out. See, I'm pushing it out. And then it's going to pop open. It's just about to pop open. There, it just popped open. And I'm going to give a little bit more air to, and pull away a little bit just to let it release completely. And I'm going to kind of wiggle it free here. There, it just popped out from the working channel. Now. Again, these are these little, little things that you learn. You learn that you, know, you don't panic if it doesn't open up right away. It's because it's 
hung up in the working channel. Working channel wasn't designed with an elevator for placement of aluminum opposing stent. You know, we, we're all kind of held hostage to endoscope technology, and so we have to develop our accessories to work with the existing endoscopes. Um, be great if we could also design our own endoscopes to work with our accessories, but it doesn't work that way. So realize that these little things that you encounter are because we've adapted our accessories to work with our, uh, our endoscopes. There's an elevator on the end. Our accessories can hang up on the structures, and you've got to free them off from that, and you've got to sort of understand what's happening. All right, so now there we are. You see the bile draining. Good sign, right? And uh, now we are ready to dilate the lumen of the lumen opposing stent. We could even um, potentially look at it with ultrasound, but in the interest of time, we've got our wire here. Uh, this is the advantage of having a wire in there. Um, not that it, you cannot put your dilating catheter easily, uh, freehand style, through the lumen opposing stent. It's actually very easy uh, because the flange stabilizes your position. But if you have a wire, it's all the better. So now I'm going to have the assistant advance the wire as I pull off. So you can see on the screen here, please, on the handle, down on the handle, I'm just really, I've unlure locked. I am pulling out. Now, look at the tip here. See, I told you about the micro wires. Do you see that micro wire running along the very tip? So this is, this is true engineering a genius. So when I, uh, when I started Exlumina 10 years ago, um, I, I picked the very brightest and best engineers on the peninsula who had already had a lot of experience um, in the uh, catheter-based medtech interventional space. Um, so uh, these engineers are the ones who have, you know, I'm grateful to for having created this kind of technology. You know, I, I brought the vision and the idea of what I wanted to accomplish. The engineers made it a reality. See the bougie end there? And see how it finally tapers right to the wire. And you don't see this, but that wire, that micro wire, now runs finally along the very tip. This is all magnified. So you have to think about what kind of manufacturing detail um, goes into making one of these. And I, have, I just have to mention this because it takes hours to make one axial stent. I know that because I sat next to the workers um, down in Mountain View who made these, they're handmade. And these are just incredible uh, products of uh, hand labor, right? This is, how much today is made by hand? This is made by hand. All right, so let's pull this out. So sometimes, you know, you balk at the cost of these things, but you have to also understand what goes into a device like this to make it actually in the end so easy for us to use, so reproducible, and it's a one-time use device. So just think about that, right? It has to be robust enough to, um, to withstand all sorts of unexpected circumstances. Um, and yet, that cost can't be too excessive uh, because it is a one-time use uh, device. So it's a fine balance uh, to create a product in a one-time use um, culture uh, and that's what we live in here in the United States, uh, regrettably, because uh, I think it's carried to a, a, an extreme that is so wasteful. But that's another topic. Um, and so it, it's, it's a real challenge. I just want you to understand when we're doing these procedures, what goes into developing? We're going to dilate this up to a 12 millimeter. So we use a 12 to 15 balloon. What goes into developing a device? And that's uh, where I've spent you know, the last decade of my life uh, really understanding, you know, how, because I've all, only been at the opposite end, right, the receiving end. I'm the doctor. I receive the new device, the new tool, the, the, you know, the latest, the latest tool on the market, all excited about it. But what goes into developing a new device from its inception, from the idea, from the drawing, and literally Axios was the drawing on a napkin. That's how I created Axios 
with this concept of transluminal therapy and we need a dedicated stent for this. It can't be the stents we're using for luminal drainage um, uh, or, 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 or to expand the lumen of the GI tract, which is what we're using it for. This is transluminal. So we have to switch from a, a luminal platform to a transluminal platform. What's, what are the features you need for transluminal therapy? So, and then you need a different delivery system from the delivery system that we use for luminal therapy. All right, now I'm uh, advancing the dilating catheter. So this is a CRE balloon, 12 to 15. I don't think we need to go to the 15. Um, we'll just go to a 12. And uh, by the way, so do you dilate or don't you dilate? Well, if this patient had a coagulopathy, I would not dilate. I would say just let the stent dilate on its own. Uh, there's no need to blow it up to dilate it immediately. In this case, I'd like to show you how we can use this as a port to perform intervention in the gallbladder. So I'm going to do it, and I think it's safe. All right, so let's dilate this up. This is under endoscopic vision. Balloon's going up. And I have to pull a little bit just so that the, um, the balloon doesn't slip in. Go on. Go up, please. What's also nice about the lumen opposing stent is how the balloon straddles and remains fixed across the stent. And um, I could tell you endless stories of, of the development. We had dog bone like balloon catheters. We had all sorts of different devices that we had created that we thought we might need. It turned out we ended up not needing that and we can use a off the shelf device. This is a CRE balloon. This is not designed for dilation of a transluminal stent, of course. But it works just fine. So there's no need to develop a dedicated balloon. But we actually did develop that. Um, all right, so we're at 12, and I think, I think that's going to be enough. I'll go to 13.5. We'll meet halfway. We won't go to the 15, but we'll go to 13.5 and go down now. All right, so you're going to see... There, it's dilated. Now I'm going to switch out. You can even look in a little bit. See that? That's the inside of the gallbladder. But we're going to, and you see the cholecystostomy tube in there. See it? What is this lumen opposing stent doing? It is holding the lumen of the duodenum and the gallbladder in apposition, lumen opposing. And it's preventing any leak from either the enteric side, right? So that would be bowel contents. And, but more importantly, it's preventing bile leak. Um, it's fully covered, so it's sealing off the tract, and it's, expand, it's an expandable stent. It's a SIMS, so it is pushing against the fistula tract that we've created to seal it off. So it's about a stent that ensures that there's no leakage from both sides. And it's a short stent, and it needs to be short, because um, we want to minimize collateral damage. We don't want the end of the stent sticking out against either of the opposing walls, be it the duodenal wall on the other side or the gallbladder wall on the other side, because that can cause injury, can cause bleeding, ulceration, whatever, perforation. Um, now, in the case of a pseudocyst, we also want the pseudocyst to collapse. So we want to have room for the cyst to be able to collapse. Now, the gallbladder is different. We're not expecting the gallbladder to collapse and involute. Um, that could be potentially in the future a goal, right? So basically get atrophy of the gallbladder. So it's kind of like a autocholecystectomy. That actually is some stuff I patented back when I was patenting all this stuff. The idea of a um, spontaneous... Uh, uh, involution of the gallbladder, so a, a, an, an auto cholecystectomy, ex essentially. An idea. There have even been ideas, as you read through the thousands and thousands of ideas and patents out there, um, you know, there's, you could go in and you could ablate the mucosa of the gallbladder, right, with any kind, RFA, um, APC. You could ablate and obliterate eradicate that mucosa and make 
the gallbladder a functional? You could do that. So these are all options, and we'll see if any of these things make sense. But my mon my, I have guided my approach to interventional endoscopy always to try not to be too, not to, not to get, uh, it's called hubris, right? Not to think that I can really do it any better than our creator did. So if I can just restore what our creator did, I'm happy. And I think when we start thinking we can actually do it better, I mean, just think of it. What is a gastric bypass? It's sort of, you know, our, our perception that we can do it better and we can come up with a better solution. And sometimes it ends up, um, it, it ends up surprising us that um, we open up all sorts of new problems. All right, so let's get back to the topic. And this is the, this is uh, our view into the gallbladder. This is cholecystoscopy. This is our stent. And really, um, probably to remove this stuff, it comes coming out very nicely. I'm really happy we have the 15 millimeter. Look at that. Yeah, there it is. It's just, I will tell you, you don't need to remove this now. It'll just all come out on its own. When I go back in a few weeks, uh, this will be empty. And then we'll remove this cholecystostomy tube. That's a beautiful view. And we can irrigate, see? So the, 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 what I love about interventional endoscopy is that really we focus now more on uh, obviously minimizing the collateral damage, right? We're trying to avoid surgery, but also we're trying to do things in a more clever way, and we're trying to be more faithful to how our creator created it, um, and really trying more to restore as much rather than trying to create new solutions or better solutions. Our creator has the, had the best solutions, and if we can restore when things break down or need to be reinforced. Um, and what we've, what we've done here, if you think about it, is we have just created an alternative pathway uh, for the bile to drain. That's all, and that's where the bile normally goes. It goes in the duodenum, right? So we've actually remained as faithful as we can to the original master plan, the original blueprint of how it was created, which after all is why all of us went into medicine, right? Because we all were just so amazed at how this body of ours works, of all living beings, works so miraculously. So now I'm starting to sound like a preacher or something, so I think I'll, um, I'll uh, end here, and we'll go to our next case. But uh, I think a, a, great, uh, a great case to show you how the axial stent um, is not just about internal drainage, uh, but also about being able to perform intervention. I mean, we could do lithotripsy here if we wanted to, EHL, directly under direct guidance. We could pass a lithotripsy basket in here and crush these stones and remove them. But I'll tell you, I think they're all just going to spontaneously um, uh, drain out or evacuate uh, spontaneously by the time we go back in a couple weeks. Thank you very much.
what these gastric fundal varices look like. So this is a diagnostic gastroscope, and we're just advancing it down is a solving issue. You'll note there are uh, no really significant esophageal varices. There is some evidence of scarring. So I suspect he had some band ligation done. We don't have his complete records, but you'll see the scarring in the esophagus. So he probably had some band ligation done. But there are no varices that I see at this time. Now we're coming down to the cardia. So there are really no junctional varices. This is important for the classification of his varices. So no junctional varices, no esophageal varices. And now we're going to go into retroflexion. And we're going to give some CO2 and blow up the fundus and take a look. Now, you already see this large convolute that's starting to protrude toward us. And it is large. In fact, it's scary. Right? I mean, if this were to bleed, I'm actually surprised that he survived his last bleed. Because this is under very high pressure. You're looking at the tip of the iceberg. So there's a large convolute of gastrorenal collaterals behind this. You might even you know, wonder whether this is a bit at the margin of what we can accomplish. But let's look at it with the US, OK? So we don't see any other varices, no ectopic varices. Now, our star anesthesiologist, the rose, is already starting to cringe. He's already opening up all his drawers for you know extra, extra support here <laughs> if the patient starts to massively. What I can tell you, though, is that if you were to try to treat these with the conventional endoscopy-guided method, you may not complete your procedure because you would probably get a waterfall of blood spurting out after you puncture this from the stomach lumen. And, and I, then I really understand why your anesthesiologist you know, is checking to make sure that he's paid the premiums for his liability insurance and so forth. But um, I think if we do it EOS guided, and we're going to try to do this transesophageal rather than transgastric, I think we could actually accomplish this. But let's see. All right. Now we're going to switch to our echo endoscope. And we can use a diagnostic echo endoscope because we're not placing any large diameter devices through this. We're going to use a 19 gauge needle, standard FNA needle, to puncture the varix. So um, either, you know, either the diagnostic or therapeutic. Now, the only reason why you might want to use the therapeutic is in the event of bleeding you certainly are going to get better suction through a therapeutic. Um, the forward view scope is an interesting scope that I was using quite routinely for one major reason, and that is that you have a water jet channel, and I really like that. So there's a water jet channel that you can use to flush away any debris or clots or so. And sometimes, if, certainly if you have a patient with active bleeding, it's very useful to have that forward view to use that if you have it available. And it has a 3.7 millimeter channel. So uh, those are uh, pluses. Um, but you can certainly do this with a standard curvilinear array. The drawback of the, uh, of the forward view scope is the optics are not as good as our current generation of CLA echo endoscopes. Um, having said that, though, being a forward view scope, you can actually go into retroflexion with this scope and see the fundal varices, which is very difficult to do using the CLA echo endoscope. All right, so Kate has tested the balloon. Everything works well. She's given me thumbs up, right? Did you give me thumbs up? Yes, yeah. thumbs up. Okay, so now we are going to insert our echo endoscope. And she gave me the, uh, is this the therapeutic one? Yeah, which is fine. And we have actually probably more therapeutics than we do diagnostic because we do a ton uh, of transluminal drainage. Now, I'm in the stomach, and you should have two views there. There we go. Uh, so you should see. I'm going to have you uh, make the EUS view large. And what we're going to do is put some water now. Now, this is where the water jet with the forward view would have been very nice, right? 
So then we automatically just step on the panel and we can fill the lumen up. Here, we have to ask Kate to do a little work, give me the syringe, fill this up, get another syringe ready. Um, and we're going to fill the fundus with water and I'm going to suck out some of the air too, make it easier. But the good news is that the water preferentially goes to the fundus. That's not always the good, good news when you're trying to look at a submucosal lesion in the antrum, for example. But here, it's good news. Now, on EUS, you know, you're, you're, I don't even think I have to show you what you're looking at. I think everyone sees it. These are gigantic. They've got lots of vigorous flow. And it just kind of goes everywhere. Back here, there's a splenic hilum. These are massive. Massive, all right? Let's just measure this out. Now, these are the gastrorenal shunts. We're not, we're not putting coils and glue into this. But look at these shunts. This is huge. This is 2.3. Now, one, this is not widely available in the U.S., but if I were consulted on this case and it were available, I would consider the option of BRTO. So this is the balloon retrograde obliteration done by the radiologists because they can actually target these gastrorenal shunts quite nicely. I'm actually surprised, though, that the radiologists didn't really get their coils here because I don't see the coils here, right? I mean, I will look for them. I'm wondering, you saw the coils on the CT scan very nicely. They were very prominent. But I don't see them, and I should see them with the U.S. because it's metal. It should be very bright, but I don't see them. So where are those coils that the radiologists placed? Maybe here, there's something that seems to shadow a little bit there. Maybe if you look here. All right, so regardless, I think we can treat this here. This is intramural. This here is extramural. We don't wanna to touch this. If you try to put a coil in here, it'll swim away. So our coils, the largest coil we have has a diameter of two centimeters. In fact, I wonder when the radiologists do their treatment, because we're actually using the same coils that the radiologists use, what would a radiologist put in something like this? The largest size is two centimeter diameter. So you look at the diameter of the coil and you look at the length of the coil. Now the length of the coil also goes up to, I think two centimeters. And what the length determines is how many loops you get. So the length is how many loops form. The diameter is diameter, right? The diameter of the loop. If you have a varix that is 10 millimeters, well, you don't want to put in a 7 millimeter coil, right? Because it'll flow away. So you want to use a larger diameter. So you, you customize the diameter to the size of the vessel that you're treating. Makes sense. All right, so we don't want to touch this here. We want to go here. Now, the question is, can we do this transesophageal? What does that mean, transesophageal? Well, that means we're going from the esophagus, and this is the cruce muscle, and the fundus is somewhere down here, but we don't even, normally we see the fundus here, normally, right? Because it runs parallel to the distal esophagus. Normally, I would show you the fundus, but we don't see the fundus. Why? Because there are huge gastrorenal shunts here, gigantic. And we don't want to treat those. So to go transesophageal means we would have to go through the gastrorenal shunts to get to where the fundus is, which is down here. The fundus has been displaced because of these huge gastrorenal shunts. So that's actually not an option. Now, I, I prefer to go transesophageal if I can, but I can't. This is not an option for this patient. All right, so now we come back to these guys, and I can treat these. 
but I'm going to be doing a transcardia. It's not transesophageal. It's not really trans, you know, gastric or so because I'm still high up there. I'm not coming in my normal retroflex position that we would use if we did this endoscopy guided. But it's not ideal because I always prefer to go transesophageal, transcruel if I can. Let's get our FNA needle now, 19 gauge. And there's no feeder vessel that I can identify here where I could say, look, if we hit this feeder vessel, maybe this guy here down at the bottom. But I think in this case, we just stay focused on the intramural varices that we see. So our 19 gauge needle, standard FNA needle, and what we've done is we've primed it, we've primed it with saline. Okay, so the stylet is out. It's been primed with saline. And why is that? Because we do not want to inject any air accidentally into the varix once we puncture it. We want to make sure that we don't contaminate it with any air. Um, we should always have fluid in there, whether it be our saline, uh, flush, or blood. All right, so now we're going to bring the thumb screw down. And I don't know whether there's a camera that can show this. I don't know what they're looking at here. But I'm going to advance. This is just like what you saw before with, with the Axios. Now, one thing I can tell you about a 19 gauge is with a plastic sheath, unlike a coil sheath. So a plastic sheath will stick against the elevator. It won't negotiate the elevator at times. And if you encounter resistance advancing your needle, do not force it because you will puncture your working channel. So you've got to go back, and you've got to advance your sheath forward. In fact, it's probably a good practice to always advance your sheath first. But it's actually not necessary when you use a coil sheath. Uh, and that's why I like coil sheaths. But this doesn't come with a coil sheath, only a plastic sheath. All right, so now I'm going to advance this now. And... You can see the needle at the top, right? It's a little echogenic. And now I'm ready to puncture into right here. I'm just going to go right into this guy here. I'm in. You can see it. It's, and we're going to aspirate. So if I have our camera looking at this, please, aspirate. You can see there's blood flow. No surprise. And now we're going to flush it. So we're flushing the needle free of blood because we don't really want blood in there. Some will come back. But we want to minimize that. Why is that? Because we're going to put the coil in. And the, the blood is going to increase the resistance as we advance our coil. So we've, we have attached the introducer, it's a lure lock, to the end of our FNA needle, right, where normally the stylet goes. So it's lure locked on here. And we are advancing the coil into the FNA needle. Now, once the FNA needle, uh, once the coil is advanced into the FNA needle, we can remove the introducer. We don't need it anymore. It's easier. And now the assistant is advancing the stylet, using it as a pusher to push the coil out of the needle. And I'm going to pull back as the coil comes out. And I might even direct where I want my coil to go. In fact, I'd like my coil to maybe start down here. I'm going to kind of maximize. You know, this is like a roller coaster here. So these are like septae, but they communicate. So I'm going to see what the coil does when it starts to come out. And that's OK if I just place it here, but maybe I can get it to go in the lower half. I probably would rather go into the lower half. But let's see if I can do that or find a way to get it there. It's kind of, there's like a septum or a fold there. All right, let's just put the coil out because we don't want to waste too much time. Otherwise, it'll get really sticky. It's pushing out. You see it. It's beautiful, very echogenic. There's no problem seeing these coils. There's coil number one. Now, because these are so big, I'm going to have our assistant insert a second. We're going to first flush the needle very carefully. And while she's getting ready, I'm going to go down here to deeper level. See there. All right, now I'm going to put another coil down here. OK, so same, same protocol here. 
same steps. We flushed it, right? Now it's coming, flushing. You see the air bubbles coming, uh, not air bubbles, but the water. It's actually a little bit of air in the H2O. There is an O in the H2O, so that's what you're seeing. And now we are attaching, lure locking our introducer. That introducer comes with a kit, so this is nothing that uh, special. Comes in the kit that the radiologists use. And we have introduced the coil now into the FNA needle. No need for the introducer. Now we are advancing the stylet. And we'll, once again, wait for the coil to come out. So all of this is, is very controlled. It's under vision. And this is why those of us who, who are accustomed to using EUS always feel more comfortable when we can see what's going on versus doing it blindly, just endoscopically. OK, you see the coil unraveling. Very nice. Now, these coils have synthetic strands wrapped on the coil. It's an alloy. And now we're ready to start injecting the glue. So we got two coils in there, and we're going to inject the glue. The idea here is our coils serve as a scaffold to hold the glue in place to prevent it from flowing away and embolizing. After all, given the large size of these varices, we really want to minimize the risk of embolization. That risk is, is significant. And we're using uh, Dermabond, uh, which is 2-octal cyanoacrylate. It has a longer alkyl chain. And as a result of that longer alkyl chain, the polymerization time is much longer, which is a desired thing, a good thing from my standpoint, because it gives us more time to inject the glue in. So we're injecting it over some 30 to 45 seconds. And as the glue literally drips in there, the issue I have with using histoacryl or the N-butyl-2 cyanoacrylate is that you have to inject it so quickly that you have a very high velocity as it's going in. And you may actually, I think, increase the risk of embolization. If you let it just drip in, then um, it, I think, it decreases that risk. This is all anecdotal and hypothetical, never proven. but. In the end, we're called gut doctors for a reason, right? Because we use our gut. It's got to make gut sense. It's got to make sense to us when we do this. So we love the evidence when we have it. But when we don't, we rely on our gut. All right, so the glue is dripping in there. And as it does, you see how it's getting all echogenic. And it's plugging up the lumen. And it looks. So Kate just, you know, just mentioned to me that she's doing it a little bit slower. We have a 19 gauge. It's, uh, we, we don't have to worry about the glue clogging the needle. You could not do this with N-butyl 2. You'd have to press it uh, very, very, you have to push it very hard. Or you have to dilute it with a substance like lipiodol. So some agent that will slow down the polymerization. So lipiodol is used actually because it's a contrast agent. Uh, and uh, this, in the early days, was done under a fluoroscopic guidance, right, with concomitant fluoroscopic. And why was that? Because of the concern for embolization, that number one. But remember, this all evolved from radiology. So Nipsahendra is the first to describe the use of glue to treat gastric varices, that was back in 1987. He was not the first to use glue to treat gastric varices. That was being used by the radiologists for some time. Uh, please, again. And uh, Nip Sahendra, though, his genius is that he uh, observed the radiologists and everything they did. And then he very cleverly adapted those things that he thought would work for endoscopic treatment. So he is the first uh, to describe this treatment, of course. But he's also the first to do biliary stent drainage, watching the radiologists praise percutaneous drains. Um, and, um, and he's the first to start using uh, the glide wires, uh, hydrophilic coated wires, uh, which radiologists were, all w were using routinely. So these are all we've benefited usually from the prior experience of the radiologists. 
So ironically, you know, we're, we put the radiologists who we've learned from and we, we have to thank that we're able to do all of these things today. We've, we've put them out of business. So that's, that's a big thanks to them, isn't it? Um, but it's for, the, it's for the best for our patients. And, of course, the radiologists have moved on to other things. All right, so I'm going to remove now. Okay. I've given three. Three, yes. Um, you know, go ahead and give a fourth. I'm putting a lot of glue in today because these are so big. We usually don't. Usually it's one coil, one glue. But I'm going to just fill this up uh, with a fourth. Uh, with a fourth in, uh, so these are aliquots of really about 0.5 cc's. Um, and so, you know, in total, it's maybe about two cc's that goes in. Um, I'm just talking because, you know, there's not much to say in terms of what we're doing right now. We're just keeping our view uh, of the ultrasound image, watching the glue go in, watching it spread. And your risk of embolization now progressively decreases because the glue itself is acting as a scaffold for the next injection of glue. So uh, the risk decreases as you do further injections. Uh, so once you, it's really that first injection of glue that's the concern. That's where you have the highest risk of embolization. And that's really why, it, in my opinion, it's so important to place the, the coil first before you inject the glue. Because otherwise that stuff just streams right away. And I know that because I used to do this under fluoroscopic guidance in the early days when Niv Sahendra developed this. And I worked with Niv Sahendra uh, in the 1990s when he pioneered all of this. All right, so we've got uh, our injection in. I'm going to, we're flushing the needle. So we're flushing out the glue from the dead space. And I'm going to retract as soon as all of the, the dead space is out, which is about a cc, right, in the dead space, correct? So after we have had a cc, I can start retracting. You see me retracting? The needle comes back. Now I advance the sheath forward as a precaution, just to make sure that I don't have a risk of contaminating my needle. Now the glue's all in the barracks. I don't think it's spilling out into the esophageal lumen or the stomach lumen. I'm gonna pull out now. I'm not pulling this through the working channel because these scopes are expensive. So we don't want to take any risk, even though I think it is negligible, uh, that we could contaminate or we could spill glue into the working channel. So what the nurse is doing now is once I'm out, the nurse cleans off the tip of the sheath, the uh, the uh, FNA needle sheath, and then pulls it out. All right, at this point, what we can do are one of two things. Um, let me just quickly look again, but you need to wait about five minutes for the complete polymerization. Uh, so it, it only makes sense to go down and palpate these to make sure to confirm that they're hard on instrumental palpation, endoscopic, if you wait five minutes. Uh, what we can do, though, is we can look with EUS, and we can just sort of see if there are any uh, big guys that we want to additionally inject. And maybe there are. Let's take a look. Remember, we only want to get the varices that are intramural. You see the coils here inside. This is what previously you saw those big lakes, there are no big lakes anymore. This is the intramural. Now these, these guys, well, they're, they're still there. We want to stay away from this. And, and, and look, there's a little bit of something fluttering there. You see, that's, that's how easy, it, it's like just kind of hanging there. So you have to have a lot of respect, and it's hanging on the coil. So you have to have a lot of respect for what can happen uh, when you inject glue into a vascular system where there's, well, where there's you know, vigorous flow, as there is in these varices, um, and when they're so large. I mean, it's sort of like injecting into the IVC or something when they get this big. It looks, I think, pretty good, and I don't really see anything that I need to go. I mean, this little pockets here, this will, even here, look, there's no flow, right? It looks a little hypoechoic, anechoic. 
there's no flow. Why? Because I've occluded everything. There's nothing feeding this pocket, and that'll thrombose. So I think this is a really nice result. It looks great. You don't see the varices anymore. And now, you know, just for the fun of it, we can go down with the gastroscope and confirm that things are starting to harden the varices. In other words, a sign that the varices are plugged up with the glue and coil. So uh, the, 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 I, the teaching point is identify patients with large gastrorenal ver, uh, collaterals because those are much higher risk and maybe even consider a multi multidisciplinary discussion whether BRTO might be a better option because the Japanese literature has reported very nice results for uh, these large gastrorenal shunts using BRTO. Um, so that's, an, that's the one teaching point here. If you do embark on this, then uh, limit your treatment to just the intramural varices. Don't go outside because you're inviting disaster potentially um, and embolization and so forth. And you've got to use your largest coil, coils, and you need to put a lot of glue in. So now I'm going to go into retroflexion. Now, what is the amazing thing is there's virtually not a drop of blood. Of course, there's got to be a drop of blood where I punctured. So that might be what you're looking at here. I can't avoid that because I did not go transesophageal. But I'm even going to wash that out, off for you. See? Look at that. I washed it off. And if I had done that secretly before coming on screen, I could have said, there's not a drop of blood. Well, there's one right there. OK, so enough of the cosmetics here, the Hollywood. You're, you guys are down in the Hollywood area. So I've got to, of course, you know, uh, act like, as they say, do, do in, in Rome as Romans do. And so I you know, do in Hollywood as Hollywooders do. Uh, let's uh, palpate this. Although, actually, you're, you're kind of in a different territory. That'd be more Simon Lowe's uh, district. I don't know if, he's, if Simon's still there. I saw him on the program. Uh, if Simon is there, uh, my, my warmest to Simon. He's my, my alter ego down there. We're kind of like twins, right? The one twin went up here, and the other stayed down in Southern California. I used to be down there, too, but, you know, figured... You don't need two Simon Lowe's in Southern California. All right, now let's sort of see. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I'm not going to be really aggressive here because uh, he's got portal, you know, portal hypertension, portal hypertension gastroid, but this is hard. I didn't show you that beforehand, but those of you that have done this know when you palpate these things, these varices, before treatment, I mean, you just sink right into them. Now, this one's softer. This one is softer, Okay. But uh, this will thrombose. And it might be that one area that I showed you with EUS where it was um, uh, not completely obliterated. I can't really get at the one up there. So this is just, but this is nice and hard. See, this, and look, it's hard. So I'm happy. No bleeding. We're going to bring this fellow back, this 50-year-old patient who has been through a lot. Um, and I honestly think if we have prevented him from another potentially fatal gastric variceal bleed, we have done him a huge service because everything that he's had done so far, colectomy for colon cancer, liver transplantation, biliary drainage procedures, percutaneous drains. He's got percutaneous drains now in place. Uh, too bad he didn't get referred to us to potentially avoid that. Um, all of that is for nothing if he bleeds from a gastric varics and dies, right? All right, thank you very much. Now, if you're interested, I, I can uh, give you a, a very brief presentation on gastric, on, on uh, not gastric varices, could do that too, but on uh, gallbladder drainage. Although you did see a great case this morning, but you let me know, 
based on your program, what you'd like. Oh, yes, questions. Questions? We are interested in the talk, very much so. Okay, so I'll walk over there now. Do you have any questions, though, right now that I can answer? Uh, probably during the talk. Good, all right. to uh, Victor and the entire team at Harbor UCLA for the privilege of contributing to this course. Um, it, it's truly an honor. And uh, Victor and I, we go back uh, many decades now. Uh, I met Victor first, um, I think it's early 1990s, when I was in Hamburg, Germany, working with Nipsa Hendra. He uh, was a frequent visitor, uh, was always uh, so eager to uh, absorb uh, all of the newest developments and of course Nip Sahendra uh, was a true uh, I innovator. And uh, at one point uh, Victor uh, uh, decided to uh, import, because uh, it was really literally that at the time, import uh, interventional EUS uh, to Southern California. And so he invited me, Thomas Rush, and Locke Teo uh, to his unit at Harbor UCLA uh, to do his first live demonstration. So I don't know if Victor's in the audience, but um, of course it's challenging to invite three Europeans who have a long flight to get to uh, Los Angeles. And so uh, how does one make it as attractive as possible to come to LA? Well, number one, you invite them during the winter, uh, the winter in Europe, of course. There's no winter in Southern California. Um, so I think it was January, perfect time. Uh, so that already upped the ante here, made it more attractive. Uh, but the second thing is he told us about his sailboat and uh, that after the conference, we would go to Catalina Island on his sailboat. That definitely did it for all three of us and we were on our way to uh, his center to do the first uh, live transmission of cases from his unit. So there's a long tradition uh, to this course, and, and I just, again, just want to recognize Victor uh, for that. He's been a true champion of interventional endoscopy. All right, now let's turn to EOS guided gallbladder drainage, and I I'm asking if it's ready for prime time, uh, so let's answer that at the end. Next slide. So the gallbladder is something we always see when we enter into the duodenal bulb. It it's almost predictably there. You can also see it from the antrum of the stomach, uh, but from the duodenal bulb, it, it is right up against the, the duodenal wall there. In fact, um, 
it's easily confused for a cyst, a pancreatic cyst, for example. And when I was performing, in, performing U.S. guided pseudocyst drainage, I, at one, for, in one case, had accidentally punctured the gallbladder thinking it was a pseudocyst. It was a, a hydroptic gallbladder, a very large gallbladder, and uh, I punctured it and I got bile back. Um, and um, unfortunately, that patient developed, just from that puncture, a bile duct leak and uh, ended up having to go to surgery. So that was sort of my first encounter with EWIS guided gallbladder drainage, of course, was an intentional there. Uh, it was a misadventure of having confused the gallbladder for uh, a pseudocyst. But it, it, it emphasizes really the point that we're dealing with something very similar to a pseudocyst. We see it like a pseudocyst. It's up against the wall like a pseudocyst. Next slide. Um, and this is an instance where I drained the gallbladder successfully. This is 2008. Uh, and I used a covered wall stent to do this. But this is a patient with sclerosing peritonitis. I've underlined it because that is the, the key here. And I was able to do this successfully. You can see the wall stent. This was the old wall stent, as you can see. This is back, from, back in 2008. And here you see all the stones coming out. So this is sort of my... My, my first flirtation with EUS guided gallbladder drainage in a patient who was a non surgical candidate. And this was the only option to treat acute gallstone cholecystitis. And I was ecstatic uh, at this, the, our ability to create a cholecystoduodenostomy using a SEMS. Um, but this is a special case because this patient had sclerosing peritonitis. Next slide. Because the challenge of gallbladder drainage is that the lumens are normally not adherent. They were adherent in this case of sclerosing peritonitis. In fact, I went down to, the ra to radiology and I discussed this case with the radiologist and I asked them, what is the risk of bile leak if I try to drain this gallbladder? After all, I maybe had the very first experience in the world of a bile leak from a misguided attempt at draining what I thought was a pseudocyst, and it was a gallbladder. And the answer was, because this patient has sclerosing peritonitis, the gallbladder is probably gonna be socked in with scar tissue, and you, it should be safe. That's why I had the courage to proceed, and I was able to do it safely. That's normally not the case. There's a high risk of perforation, leakage, and peritonitis, and if you look on EUS, you will always see, with normal anatomy, an echogenic layer between the duodenal wall and the gallbladder lumen. That echogenic layer is fat tissue, mesentery. So that is that the fact that this is a mobile structure and none in here it makes this a completely different challenge. All right, let's go to the next slide. There have been reports of gallbladder drainage with plastic stents dating back to 2007, several case series done, and reporting great success. So certainly possibility. These were all, of course, non-surgical candidates. But the complication rate was 11%, and these complications were related to leak. So there was bile leak in two cases, and there was air leak with a pneumoperitoneum symptomatic in two cases. Next slide. To prevent or reduce that risk of leak, fully covered self-expandable metal stents have been used. And I used that, as you just saw in that video. And this is a design from Korea with flared ends to reduce the risk of migration. So this is 65 patients. This was reported in 2014 with acute cholecystitis. They placed at 10 by up to seven centimeter long fully covered SEMS with these flared flanges. Great technical and functional success. And yet, despite using a SEMS, there was perforation in one case. There was pneumoperitoneum in two cases. And then there were late complications. There was migration despite the flared end, ends. And there was occlusion in two cases. Next slide. So 
I started thinking about the question, why, are, why do we have bile leak? Now, obviously, with plastic stents, the, you're going to get leakage around a plastic stent. But why would you still get bile leak with a fully covered, self-expandable metal stent? How can we prevent it? And the first answer, in my mind, was we need to eliminate over-the-wire exchangers. The self-expandable metal stent is helpful after you get the stent in. You won't get leak, probably, after you place the stent. But you're going to get leak up to the point that you deploy your stent if you're doing over-the-wire exchanges. Any time, every time you remove your instrument, whatever it is, the dilating balloon, bougie, or FNA needle, you're going to get leak through that hole because your wire is not plugging up that hole. Really what you want is a single device that will enable you to puncture, prime the tract, dilate the tract, and deploy your stent all, in, all at once. I won't say one step because these are actually multiple steps, but you're combining these steps into one device. So can we come up with a device that allows us to do that? That's the challenge that I posed, at least for, for myself. And then, of course, we need a SAMS that is designed, dedicated for transluminal drainage, because all of our SAMS were not designed for that. They were designed for luminal uh, recanalization. And this would need to be leak proof, and it would need to be migration proof. And even with that Korean design with flared ends, you still had migration. So that's not the ideal stent yet. Next slide. So these are the two solutions that I came up with and is the foundation for the company that became Exlumina. And today, uh, it, uh, the, this product line is, 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 is being marketed by, by Boston Scientific. So the first, and I'm, I'm going to mention this first because I actually consider this the more important of the two is the elimination of over-the-wire exchanges. So this cautery-enhanced delivery system allows us to now puncture the gallbladder, enter into the gallbladder with our sheath, which is preloaded with our SEMS. And we can immediately deploy the SEMS after we've entered into the gallbladder. So we want a one device, puncture to stent deployment without any exchanges. Now, the SEMS itself for transluminal drainage, this is actually, you know, it's very simple if you think about it. It's just big cartwheels, you know, big flanges. But what's unique and where the engineers did a fantastic job is the design so that you get a hugging of these two walls against one another to keep them in apposition. So that's a unique feature of this. Of course, it needs to be fully coated and it needs to be short because you want it just to straddle the wall. You don't want it extending into either the duodenal lumen or the bowel lumen, and you don't want it extending into the gallbladder. Next slide. So this is the animal study that I published in 2011. This animal study doesn't do justice to the many, many dozens of studies that were done that led to the, to, to the final designs that that we came up with. Uh, myself with a, a, a team of just great, great engineers. As I mentioned earlier, literally uh, the, the best here on the peninsula in Silicon Valley. Um, and and I, I always like to take an opportunity to recognize them because they sort of, they're the forgotten heroes, if you will. These engineers are, are just amazing and they make this possible. So this is just for survival pigs, uh, but it represents the culmination of many trial and error and many designs and so forth. This is just sort of the final where we said, okay, now we're ready to publish. And we had created a port for cholecystoscopy because our goal was not just the drainage, it was really to extend the reach of the interventional endoscopist to a structure outside the GI tract. So an extension of therapy to the extra luminal space. And all these stents remained patent at two months, so we had survival studies. All of them were easily removable. That was part of the design challenge uh, as all of this went through the trial and error and different prototypes and so forth. And all of them showed 
uh, focal wall adherence on the necropsy studies. Uh, you can see that on the bottom right, the gallbladder uh, and the bowel wall, the, duod uh, the th this is not duodenum, it's actually stomach because of the anatomy of the pig, um, and you can see the stent. All right, so you can see on the images on the left, you can see the scope going through the axial stent into the gallbladder. We injected contrast, you can see it now um, anterogradely, right? This is an anterograde injection into uh, the bile duct via the cystic duct. Um, and there on the right lower image, you can see the view of the normal gallbladder. And for me, that was uh, amazing to, to actually see what the gallbladder looked like on its inside. I'd never seen that. Next slide. This emphasizes why I think this technology of what's now called LAMS, lumen opposing metal stent, is so critical to extend our reach. So it's not just about having a self-expandable metal stent with a bigger lumen. It's about having a stent that won't migrate, won't dislodge when we pass our scopes through it. That's, that's really the unique advance that's been made possible. So it's our ability to, for example, go in the gallbladder and you can see here, you can remove gallstones and I've done that many times now. So you can actually evacuate the entire gallbladder of all its stones. You can do that mechanically with the tools that we use for ERCP. Next slide. It's also very important that this type of technology be controlled by the operator. This is not something that you can delegate to the assistant. And why? Because there's too much at stake. There's no room, there's no margin of error that you can allow. It has to be done 100% accurately and precisely because you're dealing with a stent that's just one centimeter in length. So you have to place those flanges very precisely and if you're off just a little bit, then it makes the difference between success and a potential you know, disaster uh, and a patient that might have to go to surgery. So uh, this design you saw, I'm not gonna go into this uh, since you just saw this in the live demonstration, but the key feature that the engineers enabled was to allow us to develop each flange independent of one another. Now that may sound right now as a very obvious thing. It's not. It took a few years to actually perfect this so that you could control the release of each flange independent of one another. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And this is a video from, uh, from Hong Kong, from their course, and uh, uh, I was able to do this case before it was allowed in the US because of FDA regulations. Um, and let's uh, let this video play just quickly. It shows really the same that you saw before. Um, and click on it, yeah. So the direct puncture of the gallbladder with the electrocautery enhanced system, hot axios, we're in the gallbladder. This patient also had a cholecystostomy that had been previously placed. Um, you see the deployment of the distal flange. Back at this time, the protocol was to look for the black mark. I, I actually don't think that's necessary. You can do this all under ultrasound guidance. You see the proximal flange deployed. You see the pus draining out, and you see the dilation of the balloon, and you see the many stones uh, with filling defects in the gallbladder. And then we proceeded to do cholecystoscopy and remove the stones. Uh, but it was a premiere for Asia, um, and it was a very gratifying experience for me uh, at the time uh, because uh, of all the restrictions we face in the US. Fortunately, we're, we, we can do this now, although it is an off-label use. The electrocautery enhanced system is currently only approved for the treatment of uh, pancreatic fluid collections. Next slide. So this is the multi-center trial that was done in Europe. And um, all of these uh, 30 patients with acute cholecystitis uh, in multiple uh, uh, leading centers in Europe uh, used the HOT system. Uh, their technical and functional success rate was uh, outstanding. Of course, these are all some of the best endosonographers in Europe. 
uh, all good friends of mine and all outstanding. In fact, there's uh, also Japan included there, I apologize, and Hong Kong. Anthony Teal is from Hong Kong. So Europe and Asia. Um, median total scope time, 15 minutes, which is remarkable, I think. And there were no serious adverse events early on. There, notably, no leak or perineum. Now, late, there were technically serious adverse events. I'm going to show you the list in just a moment. In half of the patients, um, but only 13% of these were possibly related to the stent or the procedure. Bear in mind that the criteria for inclusion in this study was that the patient was not a candidate for surgery. So these were sick patients with multiple comorbidities. And as you know, any event that occurs has to count, be, you know, be considered as a, as a serious adverse event. And then you determine what the relationship might be to the procedure or the device. Next slide. And here you see a list of the, an overview of all the serious adverse events and the review decision uh, of the committee. And you'll note that really the, the two stent-related events were actually bleeding-related. In patients that had coagulopathies or other, other predisposing factors for bleeding, there was nothing related to leak itself. And our goal was to eliminate leak. So we can't, of course, eliminate all the other things that can happen in sick patients. Next slide. So this is my last slide. So we again asked the question, is it ready for prime time? And I think the answer is yes, but we do have to meet three criteria or prerequisites. And the first is, this needs to be standardized. It needs to be controlled. Uh, it needs to be, I'd say, 100% reproducible, right? This can't be left to operator technique that varies from one operator to another. I, I think this, this, this has to be because there's so much at stake here. So this doesn't leave room for, you know, I'll show you the way I do it. We really need to do this all the same way. Um, next, it needs to be leak proof. And obviously, we need to follow the outcomes of these patients. But so far, the data is supporting that we have created a leak proof platform. And finally, and this is the open question, the only reason why we may not yet be ready for prime time, and that is that it should be durable. Now, I think you can make a strong argument for using this you know, in patients who are non-surgical candidates, where you're going to get into some debate until we have the durability data is whether we can offer this as an alternative to surgery. So the patient actually could tolerate surgery, but might we offer this as an alternative? That remains to be seen. Um, but I think we're getting very close uh, to prime time. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to present. And now uh, maybe I can take questions. If you have any questions related to either topics, gallbladder drainage or gastric varices with glue coil.